Hello and welcome to BrainFacts.org and to the Human Brain portion of the Brain Awareness Week online webinar. The full webinar was part of Brain Awareness Week, an international event to celebrate neuroscience and the brain. Check out the other portions of the presentation to learn about animal brain anatomy and function and to learn some fun neuroscience activities at home. I am Zachary Grieb, a graduate student in the neuroscience program at Michigan State University. We are going to learn about the human brain, and I wanted to start with one of my favorite brain-related quotes by Joel Davis. The human brain is the last and greatest scientific frontier. To begin looking at this complex organ, let's go over some of its basic structures and their functions. First, the largest part of the human brain is the cerebrum, which literally means brain in Latin. It is composed of the left and right cerebral hemispheres and underlying brain regions. It controls many functions, including sensory processing, or how we perceive our world, emotions, speech and communication, and critical thinking, such as solving problems in school, on the sports field, or between friends. Just below the cerebrum, we can see the cerebellum, which in Latin means little brain. It also has a right and left hemisphere, similar to the cerebrum, but it is most well known for its involvement in the coordination of motor movements. You might recall hearing a recent story of a man amazingly born without a cerebellum. As expected, he did have balance and motor difficulties, but he also had trouble with clear thinking and emotion, which suggests the cerebellum might help coordinate more cognitive functions than was originally believed. This just goes to show that there's always more to learn about the brain. So now let's take a closer look at the cerebral hemispheres, which are broken up into four different lobes. Starting with the front of the brain, we first see the frontal lobe, which plays an important role in higher cognitive level functions, such as planning, critical thinking, and understanding consequences of our behaviors. These functions are associated with the prefrontal cortex, which interestingly is one of the last brain regions to fully develop. In fact, the prefrontal cortex might not be fully developed until an individual reaches their mid-20s, and experts think that this might explain why teens are more likely to participate in risky behaviors than adults. The prefrontal cortex is also associated with the inhibition of impulsive behaviors and many medicines that are used to treat attentional deficit disorders such as ADD and ADHD target the frontal lobe. Additionally, along with higher level cognitive functions, the frontal lobe is also involved in the planning and control of motor functions. The primary motor cortex shown here is responsible for the execution of voluntary motor movements. The second lobe that we come across is the parietal lobe, named for the parietal bone of the skull. The somatosensory cortex, shown in pink, is dedicated to processing the sense of touch. The cortex actually contains a map of our body with more sensitive areas like your hands, taking up a larger portion of the somatosensory cortex than less sensitive areas, like your legs or torso. Furthermore, you might already know that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and vice versa. And this is true in the somatosensory cortex as well. Touch on your right hand will activate neurons on your left cerebral hemisphere. The parietal lobe is also very important in proprioception, considered our sixth sense. You might not have heard of proprioception before, so let's do a quick demonstration to explain the concept. First, close your eyes. Next, place both hands out in front of you. Now clap your hands. What you should have noticed is that it was fairly easy to clap your hands together without missing. Proprioception is being able to sense where your body is in space, and it is very important for many things we do every day, like walking. Imagine trying to walk while having to constantly look at every single movement that you make with your legs and feet. 
The next major lobe is the temporal lobe, named after its location beneath the temples. This lobe is very important in auditory processing, olfaction or smell, and memory. Understanding and producing speech is another function controlled by the temporal lobe, and speech is partially localized to Wernicke's area, which is located only in the left hemisphere. Damage to this region can result in a condition called fluent aphasia, in which the individual can string words together and the tone, cadence, and speed of the speech is normal, but the resulting sentence has no meaning. The words simply don't go together. Similarly, these individuals are also unable to understand written or spoken language. The fusiform gyrus, which is located near the bottom of the temporal lobe, is another interesting region. Damage to this area can result in, a, in prosopagnosia or facial blindness. This results in impairment in the ability to recognize faces, including the individual's own face, without affecting any other visual abilities. Individuals with facial blindness often must rely on hair, clothing, voice, or other cues to identify people. The final lobe is the occipital lobe, which is derived from Latin and literally means behind the head. The occipital lobe is vital for visual processing, and we can demonstrate this by using optical illusions. When you look at this image, which square, either A or B, looks darker to you. Likely you think it looks like square A is darker, but if we actually compare these squares side by side, we can see that they are in fact the same shade of gray. Why does this occur? This illusion illustrates that our visual system needs to quickly discern between different colors or shades in our environment. One possible explanation takes into account the local contrast of the image. Our brain determines that square B is light gray because of the contrast with the dark squares surrounding it, but square A is dark gray because it is surrounded by lighter squares. So even though A and B are the same shade, they appear different because of the comparison to neighboring squares. However, scientists are still studying how exactly optical illusions work. The interesting concept here though is that how we perceive the world is completely dependent upon our brain, and this is a great example of that. Those two gray boxes are the same shade, but our brain tells us that's not the case, so we perceive them as different shades. Next, we will go into more detail of the subcortical areas of the brain and their functions. These are regions located below the cerebral cortex, Whereas the cortex is involved in higher cognitive functioning, these regions tend to play a role in functions that are considered evolutionarily older. For example, the expression of fear, regulating hunger, and our breathing. In particular, we will cover the corpus callosum, the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, the pineal gland, the brainstem, the hippocampus, and finally, the amygdala. In most ways, the two hemispheres are similar, but they do need to communicate with each other for the brain to function normally. The hemispheres communicate by way of the corpus callosum, which in Latin means tough body. It is composed of axons, the parts of the neuron responsible for sending signals to other neurons. So think of the corpus callosum as the telephone wires which allow you to call a close friend. Sometimes, patients who suffer from very severe seizures and who do not respond to less invasive treatments will have their corpus callosum cut, what is known as a split brain procedure. This results in a fascinating condition. First, remember that the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. Additionally, recall that Wernicke's area, which is important for speech production, is only located in the left temporal lobe. For split brain patients, if they touch or hold an apple in their left hands, they will not be able to tell you what the object is. The presence of the apple would be processed by the right parietal lobe, but the speech center is in the left temporal lobe. 
Since the two hemispheres cannot communicate, the left hemisphere would not receive any information about the object. The hypothalamus, which literally means below the thalamus, is an area of the brain that is important in the control of many endocrine or hormonal systems in the body, all while being about the size of an almond. The pituitary gland, also known as the master gland, contains tissues that produce many hormones and is located just below the hypothalamus. It is about the size of a pea in humans, and in this picture, the pituitary is represented by a green dot. While the hypothalamus controls many different hormonal functions, today I'm going to talk about its role in the stress response. First, when you experience a stressful situation, such as taking the SAT, your hypothalamus responds by releasing a hormone into tiny blood vessels which lead directly to the pituitary gland. When this hormone reaches the pituitary gland, it causes the pituitary to start producing a different hormone, which is released into the blood where it travels to the adrenal cortex located just on top of the kidneys. When it reaches the adrenal cortex, it causes the release of cortisol, the stress hormone. Once in the blood, cortisol causes the release of glucose, the sugar our body uses for energy, into the bloodstream and shuts down our immune system and gastrointestinal system, among many other functions. This system is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA axis for short. And why this cortisol response to stress was particularly important for our ancestors' survival, by activating their flight or flight response in dangerous situations, today, chronic stress is an unhealthy situation which can put people at risk for heart disease and other illnesses due to the suppression of their immune systems. The pineal gland is a small hormone gland known for secreting melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that most notably controls sleep timing. In darkness, the pineal gland produces more melatonin and promotes sleep. Indeed, it is so sensitive to light patterns that there are differences in secretion between the long days of summer and the shorter days of winter. Quite interestingly, the pineal gland is one of the few brain regions that doesn't have the blood-brain barrier, which protects most other brain regions. This makes the pineal gland more vulnerable to blood-borne toxins or foreign substances like bacteria. The pineal gland also has an interesting history, as in the past it was considered the area from which the soul interacted with the physical body. In fact, the famous philosopher René Descartes called the pineal gland the principal seat of the soul. The brainstem is the last section of the brain before it connects to the spinal cord. It has three main parts, which are the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. The midbrain contains many different types of neurons, including serotonin and dopamine neurons. These midbrain dopamine neurons are important for reward and motor movements. And today we will talk a bit about the dopamine neurons involved in motor function. These dopamine neurons are part of the substantia nigra, which in Latin means black substance due to the darker shades of these cells when compared to nearby areas. These neurons are particularly interesting because the neurodegenerative Parkinson's disease is characterized by a substantial loss of these neurons. This loss results in the typical movement deficits of Parkinson's disease, such as tremor and difficulty walking. Therefore, many current Parkinson's disease treatments have been made to try and replace this lost dopamine signal in the midbrain. The second major part of the brainstem is the pons, which translates to bridge. This translation generally explains its function quite well, in fact. The pons is made up of many axons that travel from the cerebrum to the cerebellum, as well as from sensory neurons traveling to the thalamus, similar to an overpass on a highway. The third major part of the brainstem is the medulla oblongata, perhaps the most fun brain region to pronounce. The medulla is incredibly important because it controls many functions that we don't even think about, like our breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Really, the basic functions for living. In fact, it is possible to live with just the brainstem intact. A fascinating story showing this phenomenon is that of Mike the Headless Chicken. One day, when Mike's owners tried to behead him, they failed to hit the jugular vein and the brainstem. 
The result was that Mike was able to live an additional 18 months with close monitoring. Mike was closely monitored because he was unable to actually eat on his own due to the lack of a motor cortex, but the brainstem was still controlling his basic bodily functions needed for survival, such as his breathing and heart rate. The hippocampus, which means seahorse, due to the similarity between its shape and the animal, has two major roles. First, it is important in the long-term consolidation of memories, demonstrated by the fascinating case of patient HM. HM had most of his hippocampi surgically removed to stop severe seizures from which he was suffering. The unintentional consequences of the surgery was that HM then suffered from severe anterograde amnesia, meaning that he can no longer form long-term memories. For example, he would meet a doctor and then just a short while later have no memory of the person. Perhaps you have seen the movies Memento, 50 First Dates, or Finding Nemo, which popularized this phenomenon. The most interesting part, though, of the HM case was that he was still able to learn motor memories like playing a piano, even though he was unable to tell you where he learned that new skill. The second major function of the hippocampus is spatial navigation. Interestingly, the hippocampus seems to increase in size based on its own use. And in fact, there was a study that found that taxi drivers in London who have to pass an extremely vigorous test demonstrating their knowledge of all the streets in London were found to have a larger hippocampi than bus drivers who follow a limited path daily. Additionally, degeneration of the hippocampus is one of the first areas of the brain to be affected during Alzheimer's disease. It is the degeneration of this region which leads to the characteristic symptoms of memory loss and disorientation in early Alzheimer's disease patients. The amygdala, which in Latin means almond due to its shape, is an area important in the regulation of emotions. In particular, the amygdala helps us to consolidate memories associated with strong emotions, such as getting into the college that you hope for, or from tragedies in our lives. The phenomenon in which we can remember clearly what we were doing during a societal tragedy, such as the Kennedy assassination, the Challenger explosion, September 11th, or the Boston Marathon bombing, is known as a flashbulb memory. Interestingly, while flashbulb memories are more vivid, they aren't necessarily more accurate, but they show that emotion can play an important role in memory formation, which makes sense given its location just in front of the hippocampus, our memory center. The amygdala is also important in evaluating the salience or importance of a situation. For instance, when we look at frightened faces, our amygdala is more active than when we see neutral faces. It makes sense that we would want to pay attention to a scared face, as this could signal to us a potential threat, perhaps an out-of-control car. However, the amygdala can sometimes be overactive, and this is often seen in patients with social anxiety disorders and depression. Thank you guys for joining for my section on the human brain. I hope you learned a lot about this fascinating organ and some of its many functions.